heavy issues to deal with over the last few weeks and few board meetings. And so we thought we would um, go on a love offensive this <laughs> evening and share with you several, I think, good news stories. And so we'll begin with um, Dr. Well, uh, board members, to, just to continue our learning and development as educators, uh, we held a district-wide uh, professional development day this past Friday, September the 15th. And you might recall that we proposed an additional five days of PD for this school year, um, and you graciously supported us by approving the calendar and the added expenditure on behalf of our educators. I've asked Dr. Cormack to join us, our, our deputy superintendent, to join us and share just a brief recap of this powerful day of educator development. Good evening. Good evening. This past Friday, we had the great pleasure of hosting our first full day professional development uh, during this school year. Uh, none of our scholars were present, and so it was a day focused on adult learning and a commitment to our core value of a growth mindset. We appreciate the board's support for the expanded calendar and a sizable investment in our faculty and staff. Across all academic divisions and operations department, each area and division received differentiated and relevant professional development. Um, we're very proud of what occurred Friday. In these photos, you see some examples across divisions, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, some of our many offerings included training for our AP social studies educators from the college board. Um, the board, uh, you all recently supported our IB training, and so we made that investment. Montessori learning, our nurses were trained, coaches received training. Training uh, for our English learner educators across the district uh, we all responded to Dr. Green's charge and mantra that everybody needs a coach. And so as a personal privilege, I want to thank our academic leadership team, um, each one of you for your coordination and your many uh, efforts, uh, hands to make light the work in terms of supporting the moving parts. But across the district, 3,000 educators were trained and got something for them that was specifically for them. And so we very much appreciate your support, and our next full day of development uh, will be offered on February 16th, 2024. Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Um, I uh, asked Dr. Cormack to just share a little bit of, of that information. This is, you know, it, we could easily kind of breeze past this and, and just say, hey, we had a PD day because those are not uncommon, PD days. What is less common and what we haven't done much of is in the middle of the school year, scheduling a full extra day that's not about parent conferences or not a early release day, but a full day uh, to do this. And the added attention uh, that our team has put on to ensuring that um, all of our team members had something that was specialized for them. And so our AP teachers aren't attending just a, you know, a normal literacy training or something around social and emotional learning, which is important, but, you know, we, we, we really made the effort to provide programming that was special to each of our team members. And so um, the reports are, are really strong. Folks seem to really appreciate the time and attention and effort and planning and all the things that went into making the day happen. There were lots of logistics, as you might imagine, but folks uh, leaned in. And so again, huge kudos to Dr. Cormack and the instructional leadership team in total who helped to make it happen. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Doc. And board members, as you know, um, and as we saw in the video reel there, Witten and Peoples are now co-located co co in the Peoples Middle School building for the remainder of this year. I was able to visit today and spend a little time in the building and uh, observe a, uh, a student meeting. I think it was an eighth grade student meeting. Um, and the, the school principals have planned several activities um, before yesterday, which was the launch of the co-location, but also uh, throughout this week and beyond just to help to build relationships and, and community and all that sort of thing, both for scholars and for team members. And so I've asked the um, two principals, the Peoples Middle School Principal, Dr. Naomi Welch, and the Witten Middle School Principal, Paula Epps to join us and share a little more of their reflections and um, any updates from this week. We'll invite them up now.
Maybe next time we'll give you a walk-up song or something. <laughs> Theme music. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Paula Epps, principal of Wheaton Middle School. I am Naomi West, principal of People's Middle School. And we just want to first just start off by saying we've actually had a great two first days. Uh, we know that there were challenges that everyone anticipated, but we've actually had a great two first days. Uh, as Dr. Green mentioned, we do have several uh, Welcome Week activities that were planned for today uh, in collaboration with our Office of Climate and Wellness, as well as our middle school divisional coaches. And Dr. Welch will just share a few of those that we have participated in this week. So the, the wonderful thing that I've been able to experience this week are our watchdogs coming out and welcoming our students into the building every morning. Uh, the parents have expressed that they are so secure and they feel safe with them there. Um, we have been able to meet with our scholars um, every morning, but especially this morning we got them together as a group. And um, our, our scholars are positive, our teachers are positive, um, everyone is positive and excited about what we're doing this year at People's. And some of those activities uh, include, as well as we know this is an adjustment, so we're including incorporating SEL moments uh, every day. Uh, we have a fun way that the Division of Cultures created a Google slide with some fun facts about both schools as well as staff and administration. So as children are able to go through that and kind of decide and learn some different things about each other. So those are just a few of the things that we have planned this week and actually some ongoing things long term, but we've just had a great first two days and definitely appreciate all of the district as well as community support that have come out for us. Well, uh, board members, again, I, you know, we've been talking about the plans and um, leading up to the launch of this co-location um, for this school year. And, and, you know, I was prepared to just talk about what I've seen and some of what I've heard from others. But I thought it was important that you hear from the school leaders themselves. Um, and I also want to lift up that, you know, this was nothing that anyone planned. And so, you know, it's something that we had to respond to and issue. We had to respond to, um, but while I'm so thankful for all of the support across the district, around the community, our watchdogs in particular, um, but but you know others who have just been so present and, and supportive, these two leaders right here, these two ladies right here, um, I've not experienced, I've not seen even a whisper of ego or territorial um, behaviors. It's all been about how do we support these two school communities in being served and educating these scholars um, with excellence through the remainder of this year. Um, and it's just been a joy to watch the two of you work together and partner together and, and um, play off of one another's ideas and just all the things that go into this. And so I do want to say publicly to you and to your teams, um, thank you, uh, because that's been really, really transparent and, and obvious to, I think, most of us who've had any time with you all. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Green, yes, I know yes. um, two of our board members have been very engaged with the Witten and People's community, and I know you all have shared some thoughts. I mean, I just invite both of y'all, Mrs. Thompson and Mr. McGuffey, to just Maybe share some of the um, positive feedback with the community that you share with me. Sure. Um, so I had opportunity to, to participate in the parent meeting mm -hmm. um, and kind of heard a lot of fee good feedback um, from even the parents at, at point. And then on yesterday evening, I had opportunity to stop by the open house kind of incognito um, and just kind of go around and talk. And some of the teachers, they, they didn't know I was a board member. So I, that's a good thing. I, I want to hear you know, and see what is happening in the building in real time and just kind of experience it. And everything was really good, very positive, good energy, positive um, feedback um, from everybody that I did speak with um, and just seeing that, you know, even the parents hearing them talk about the way the building looks and a, a good improvement. Um, from where they were, you know, it's, yeah, this thing didn't, we didn't hap make it happen, but we had to respond, and you all have responded in a very 
good way and a positive way, and I'm so excited to be a part of the still the good things that are happening within JPS. Thank you. Yeah, so I, 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 I had um, attended the parents' um, meeting uh, with Ms. Thompson as well and had an opportunity to um, go to the school yesterday morning. So I, was, I went, wanted to volunteer, wanted to see it. Um, and coming out of that meeting, I, I talked to a number of parents as we, were, as we were kind of walking out the door. And the one thing that anybody said sort of as a, as a the, the concern, right, was I just don't know when these kids first get here, these schools are, these schools are in competition, but I don't know how that's going to look. So I wanted to go the first day, right? And I can't say enough about the work that Principal Welch and that Principal Epps put in, the, the work that the transportation group put in, the work that the cafeteria staff put in, those kids coming in, they knew they were going to go from, you know, 260 or however many kids were there to 500 plus kids. And uh, I talked to two of them. They said, yeah, we showed up early because we knew we were going to have to get more food ready. I mean, every single person was chipping in. And um, I was there greeting kids as they were coming in the door. There was none of that. They, whatever those concerns were, it was only upbeat. It was only positive. It was handled so beautifully that if you did not know hmm. it was day one, you would not have known it was day one. Hmm. Like that's, a, that's as good a compliment as I can give you because wow. that it worked. Um, and so, I mean, it was just kind of cool to, to, to be around it. I absolutely agree. Um, there's a lot of excitement in that building for what both of those schools are contributing to one another. Um, and, uh, you know, something that uh, Dr. Cormack actually said when we were first proposing this stuck in the back of my mind, which was we don't view this as a hardship. We view this as an opportunity because mm. we need to fill gaps with everything. And I really, that's what it felt like. So I, I just want to praise everybody who's been involved in that, whether it's whether it's the school leaders, whether it's the teachers, whether it's the staff at, on site, everybody was on their game. It was great. I want to add one other thing, the positive messaging. Mm -hmm. um, the positive messaging and the two pieces of the puzzle coming together, you know, to make one. I just, I just, I was like, okay, this is so cool, you know, to let people know that um, we're one, you know. Oh, that's it. We're one. And the, the better we can understand that and we work and operate as one unit, then the better we will be as a district. Um, all of the schools deserve the same kind of excellence, yeah. the same kind of support, the same kind of love. We are one district. Uh, we might be individual schools, but we are one. And I love the theme of us working as one. We'll get more accomplished. Indeed. Also appreciated a free T-shirt. So. <laughs> One thing we do in JPS is T-shirts. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. I know people. <laughs> it's a thing. It's part of the culture. What's that? Um, thank you all for that feedback. I really appreciate you adding and, and sharing what you saw. Again, I try to share from different perspectives, but it's important when several us are, of us are seeing very similar things. Um, and the thing I'll say to the team and the broader community is, like, you know, the start of school, there's a honeymoon phase. And so as much as I know that folks worked really, really hard to have a strong launch and one that speaks to the positive culture and community and whatnot that we want to see going forward. You know, the real work continues as we live into the protocols and expectations and keep teaching those to young people and we adults keep holding them, them and ourselves accountable for what we said we were going to do. And so just want to encourage the team to keep that work going um, and, and for all of us to not lose sight of these are children. <laughs> they are middle schoolers, they are children, and from time to time they might make bad decisions. That doesn't mean that this in total was a bad decision or that those children can't recover from those. And so want to just keep all of that in front of us as we um, move forward. But I'm, I'm certainly hopeful and, ex and believing and expecting that we'll continue to deliver with excellence and that our scholars will have a great year. So kudos again. And... Um, and now, 
Uh, you saw some of this in the, the reel as well, but a little more on this. We encourage our scholars to read each summer um, and to keep their minds active and promote lifelong reading and learning. And while we ask scholars to read at least one required book based on their grade level, uh, we do challenge them to read as many books as they can during the summer. And we also, take, uh, also make reading a, a contest of sorts uh, so that scholars compete for the top reader rights. And um, then we celebrate all of those scholars at our summer reading celebration. And you saw some of that in the, in the reel. Um, our lead librarian, Ms. Jeanette Wisenton, will join us now. Um, and tell us a little more about the summer reading celebration and we'll introduce our top readers. Ooh. Ms. Wisenton. Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. This summer, 15,586 books were read by JPS scholars, employees, and community members. Amen. Adult <laughs> A total of 14,596 books were read by our scholars. Each scholar is required during the summer months to read three books. Uh, the required summer reading book, uh, title, and two titles of their choice, and complete a log for each. The students today were recognized as top readers for having read the most books during the summer months and we'll receive an additional incentive as well. It's a gift card that was given to us by the, part, by, by, by the Partners in Education's office. And Thanks. so um, when I call your name, I want you to come up and receive your certificate that's gonna be given to you by, JPS bo by the JPS board, as well as receive your uh, gift card also. So our first person from Division One Elementary Division, Division One, is Zoe Smith. She's a student at Casey Elementary. <laughs> Zoe read 100 books. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> All right, Zoe. <laughs> From the. <laughs> From Division Two. Samaya Bryant, she's from John Hopkins Elementary. She read 48 books. 48. The Middle School Division, Denari Middleton, from Northwest Jackson IB, he read 25 books. And the High School Division, Denai J. Trimble from Wingfield, 51 books read. <laughs> I just want to point out that Denai J. and Denari are brothers, and they have been doing this, this summer reading thing for three years, and they've already always placed in top readers. So I, uh, oh, yeah. The two brothers. Zoe is a first comer. Um, 100 books does well, and Samaya, first time. Uh, participant as well to make top. So they've done a great job. Samaya Bryant. Okay. Um, that's, that's it. You, at this time. What's, what school was Zoe? Zoe is at Casey Elementary. Samaya is at John Hopkins. Denai J is at Northwest Jackson IB. And Denai J is at Wingfield. Awesome. Yeah. Now, I also would like to ask the parents of these students to stand and be recognized. And if the principals are here, let's recognize them as well. <laughs> and I also want to thank our area superintendents because this year our participation was um, a plus more than it was last year with our students, and I do appreciate them getting on board with us and encouraging our students to read this summer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Oh, this is so exciting. Thank you, Ms. Wisenton. So appreciate your, um, your support and leadership in this, uh, this program. We've been, how many years have you been doing this, Ms. Wisenton? 26. 26 during the summer reading? As lead librarian. In several years, yes, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> several years uh, leading this effort along with others. Um, I did want to just note I had to double check. I thought I had heard that Ms. and I lost her name already, Samaya? Samaya. Samaya um, had been a top reader before. She's done the She's participated before, but this is her first time as a top reader. Um, but, the, but those two uh, brothers, the two gentlemen, apparently, they are um, crackerjack readers, voracious <laughs> readers, and um, have won this, uh, been our top readers previously. Let's give them all another huge round of applause. So I think I need to bring this love offensive to a, cl to a close, but do want to thank you, uh, board members, for your continued support. To all the team members who've helped us to uh, create these experiences and supporting one another, uh, even if you weren't leading out in those uh, programs. I know tons of support has gone into uh, all of it, and, and um, it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you for uh, helping to make JPS shine. With that, Dr. Sivak, I turn the meeting back over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Green. Um, we will try to continue on the theme of Love Fest this evening, though I can't promise it. <laughs> um, uh, let, um, let me just start by saying um, we don't have any public comments tonight, um, but uh, for those who would like to make public comments, um, the board does believe it's very important, and we do encourage uh, public comment. Anyone who would like to make public comment should reach out to um, Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us um, prior to the board meeting or be in the boardroom at, uh, prior to 515 to sign up. Dr. All right. Shebeck, What's that? I just want to make one comment. Please, Mrs. Back Thompson. To the, the, the videos with, I think that was two different um, events that were used out at the environmental. Uh, learning center. I, I just want to say kudos to you all for using outdoor space uh, and and you know just <clears throat> exposing our children to something beautiful in an outdoor space. Mm -hmm. You know, for just thinking outside the box, get out the auditorium and get some fresh air and be a part of that. And it looks beautiful out there. I hadn't been out there personally. I, I've been invited, but I, and I know I need to go, but. From what I'm seeing on the videos and the pictures, it looks amazing. Thank you so much for noticing that. And I, I fail to, to flag that. We are very, very pleased with the evolution of the Environmental Learning Center and the uh, increased programming that we're able to do out there, hosting other events, the reading fair, the high school um, career fair, college fair, but also the science related activities that our scholars are learning out there. And several other, we've had some adult, some uh, team member uh, events out there. So yeah, stay tuned. It's, it's pretty beautiful and, the, and Mr. Gibson is just doing a fabulous job of maintaining, envisioning, evolving that space to create something really wonderful for our scholars. Amazing. I went out. It looks amazing. <laughs> All right. The love fest continues. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Um, maybe that's also a signal for our next board uh, retreat or working session that we do it down there. Um, all right. Uh, board members, um, our next inf uh, item is an information only item. Um, and what you will see in our board prep materials, we had a resolution. Um, for a uh, limited tax note for up to $57 million. Um, I asked uh, Dr. Green to break this up into two pieces. Um, and so we're gonna go through the two pieces. The first is more about the plan, how we plan to use it. And, um, um, and this will be, I wanted to have a little bit more runway for us to hear what the plans are, possibly iterate, um, uh, and then the information, um, excuse me, the action item will be later in the board meeting uh, where the team of consultants has been identified and that's really about sizing the investment, getting the team in place. Uh, so that will be an action item and, and we really need to get them hired to 
uh, begin to um, put all the, the pieces in place to, to bring the, the resources in. We have, the team will explain this, we have some debt rolling off and we want to make sure we're able to um, uh, basically re-up with additional debt so that it doesn't affect the, the tax rolls. And so again, there'll be more information later. So with that, um, Ms. Purnell will be presenting the information, our Executive Director of Business Services, on uh, the request to approve a resolution uh, declaring the necessity of the intention to borrow. Um, and just, Ms. Purnell, it's great to see you. Ms. Purnell um, was our interim CFO from when Ms. Miller retired to when Mr. Burke took over as Chief Operating Officer. Um, and, and held the fort down, and um, I'm just, I'm, I'm genuinely, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're leading this effort. Hey. So. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. <laughs> well, good evening, Dr. Sivak, President of the Board, the Board members, Dr. Green, Superintendent, my colleagues, and JPS team. On behalf of Mr. Burke today, in his absence, the district, uh, the administration is recommending the approval of the submitted resolution to borrow by limited tax notes a maximum principal amount of not to exceed $57 million for the purposes of providing funds for making repairs, uh, alterations, addition to school buildings of the district for the purpose of uh, erecting school uh, buildings and other building use for school purposes for the purpose of purchasing uh, heating uh, plants, uh, air conditioning, fixtures, and equipment for such, such buildings, including but not limited to the procurement of laptops, tablet computers, and computers for the purpose of equipping school buildings, for the purpose of purchasing land for, the school, pur for school purposes, for the purpose of purchasing school buses and transportation equipment, and for the purpose of improving equipping such lands for such for school recreational and athletic purposes. And this is authorized by the section 3759101 uh, Mississippi Code of 1972. So there are, I know there are some questions that um, Dr. Sivak had asked in regards to the plan and uh, in that information that was provided by the district in his um, and the question was, one of the things were the facility upgrades that we are trying to do. Uh, also, the district is, is asking for a limit up to $57 million. But if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Green, correct me if I'm, not, if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but I think we're trying to go up to at least $30 million for uh, our repairs. And uh, Mr. Burke has pretty much detailed and uh, said on how those was going to be um, utilized. Facilities upgrades was like $17 million, athletic facilities 10 and emergency uh, purchases in, uh, for $3 million, which represent the entire $30 million that we are uh, hoping to recommend at some point in time. And I'll just add to that, um, you know, that we've, we've continued to iterate on the planning as we've um, um, adjusted downward the amount that we're seeking to, um, to receive through this process. Um, we've been very clear uh, throughout our thinking and com conversation with our um, our ho hopeful partners in this that um, that we want to not negatively impact um, the the tax liability uh, as a result of this, but to optimize or or to um, take advantage of an opportunity here to do some really cool and needed things. Um, we started with a much longer list, as you heard some of them, and, and as we've continued our discussion and tried to focus in on some of the major needs, as you see in the, the responses that were provided to questions, um, really, two, really two big buckets is what has lifted up for us. Continued facilities, repairs, and, and uh, upgrades to include the HVAC and um, some other renovations, some restrooms and facades at a few of our schools that really need some um, a, a refresh. Lighting and security systems to the extent that we need those and can't pay for them out of other um, dollars that we have. And then um, perhaps if we need to clear some spaces that are um, buildings that are um, in disrepair or, or challenging to us, um, some opportunities to do that, should that be a decision that the board um, makes going down the road. But also, um, we want to make sure we deliver on some of our athletic 
uh, programming. We want to continue to build on some of the great work that's already been done with bond dollars, uh, ensure that we're not overtaxing the beautiful new fields that we have by those being the lone mm -hmm. fields or the main ones used. Um, and we know we've got some other sports that haven't received the same love. So um, our swim team is you know, building and developing and, um, and increasing across the district, not just at one school. And so we know that there's some opportunities there. Um, and continuing to build out the, the sports complex at Hardy. So excited to do more there. Um, and of course, soccer and um, the baseball, softball uh, options for our scholars throughout the district. And so um, that's where we are right now. We've got a little bit of time to keep iterating on that, and especially with the facilities upgrades as we get more information. Obviously, though, the, the, that situation is dynamic. <coughs> Systems go down, needs occur, and we have to respond to those. But um, that's how we're, pro how we're thinking about the, the use of those dollars now. There's probably, not probably, there's much more need than the 30, even the 57 million. There's much more need, but um, we're excited to have this opportunity to do some things and to um, for them to be big and splashy enough for community and scholars and families to see and appreciate. So um, I think we'll pause there and see if there are any questions um, from team members, from board members. Thank you, Dr. Green. Board members, uh, what questions uh, do we have for um, the administration? Um, this may be the time to do this, maybe later, so feel free to punt it if this, if mm -hmm. this ain't the time. But um, can, can, can we get a little bit of insight in how I, I see the, um, the note that's actually rolling off and I see the, the the overall um, expenditure, whether it's 30 million, whether it's 57 million, it's not a dollar for dollar match. I understand that's not necessary for uh, maintaining a debt leverage or anything like that, but can we, can we go through the thinking of going above and beyond what's rolling off? It's not, this isn't really perfect replacement, right? So I just wondering if we can get a little bit of clarity on that. Um, so we have some friends. I think this is probably a good time to phone a friend. <laughs> I have our financial advisors, um, Mr. Namely Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't I just allow Mr. Thompson. Um, t Mr. Thompson's been before the board previously um, on some other financial matters. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Um, and are you good on the question? Or are you? Y yes, sir. Okay. As you said, you're exactly correct. It's not a dollar-for-dollar dollar match. Also, if you look at it from, there's a couple of different buckets. You have some general obligation bonds that are secured by millages that were um, approved by the constituents in an election. Mm -hmm. These are strictly underneath the three mil note, the limited tax bond, so that you're levying three mils to, protect, to pay for not only these, the ones that are rolling off, but a couple other. If you look at just those three bond issues that are outstanding secured by those three bonds, it's going to have a slow graduation. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at just those three on an overall debt level, it's going to keep it level. And so if we go up to 57 million, we can still stay underneath the three mils that you levy with the district looking at only doing approximately 30 million yeah it'll come underneath it and so you're still fine there but the 57 was designed and structured in size around just that three mil levy to kind of chew up the to utilize is maybe you a better it. way and let me say excuse me let me say a majority of school districts underneath that three mil levy they make sure they issue enough to keep that going and they use that as the district here is looking to do it as well for renovations, some capital improvement, things of that nature. It's when there's a huge capital project, they go into that general obligation and go out for election of the people. Yeah. But from hearing from the projects that the district is talking about, this fits perfectly underneath the limited tax structure. And, and just one more question. I, I, think I've, I think I've conceptualized this correctly, but all of this is essentially, these projects are essentially additive to what we pay for out of our general budget, right? We, we're not saying, um, that to we swap won't out. make HVAC repairs or whatever out of that stuff. This is additions. Right. Absolutely. Um, additional revenue and, and um, resourcing to address the issues that exist that we struggle to keep up with with our regular um, budget. And, and, to, and to do 
more of the urgent projects sooner. Sure. Yeah. Right? To be more aggressive in addressing them. Other questions or wonderings or any of that? I had one, and this has come since we met yesterday. Um, I know that one of the line items uh, that potentially would be proposed is around the raising of buildings. Yes, sir. Is, could the resources also be used to invest in an empty building as part of a larger economic development project that fit under good things for good people? Um, I, I don't, so I just wanted to, I don't have anything in mind, but it's just trying to think mm -hmm. like. How expansive can Yeah, and if there's opportunity to leverage other resources from other governmental entities. So I, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I will say the proceeds are governed underneath this structure, this limited tax yeah. structure that we talked about, what you can use it for, and I'd have to, and I'm looking at uh, our council out there, Elizabeth Clark with Butler Snow. Uh, she might be able to at least talk about the uses that you can do with these proceeds. Um, are you speaking to school-owned buildings? Uh, okay. We have many closed school buildings, former sure. school buildings, and um, so it's. I'm thinking of ways to creatively use not a lot because I know because we could exhaust sure. the whole budget on our existing sure. schools, but if there was an opportunity. Yeah, so as long as the, um, the building is going to be owned by the school, mm -hmm. um, then you can typically use it and build it or construct it, however, for whatever purposes that you want to use. If there's any private use, so if you were going to rent out certain spaces and things like that, we would have to evaluate how much of it you'd be renting out from a tax-exempt perspective. Um, because if you rent it out or if you um, if it's not strictly used for school purposes then it can cause the bonds to become taxable and if you issue taxable debt it's a slightly higher interest rate okay. so if you chose to do something like that you could carve out that portion um, potentially issue uh, tax exempt bonds with a taxable portion and or depending on the size of it there is a little bit of what we call bad use in tax-exempt bonds that allows for a certain percentage to be used for um, non-governmental purposes. Okay, that's actually does that really helpful. It does. So, okay. so um, in some ways, if there was something that were to come up, we, the, it's the it's the tax exempt versus the the taxable portion. Yeah. And, and what I'm hearing is, if if there is a taxable portion, that could potentially be used for something like. I just described like community type involvement like a theater or something where they community comes in and mm -hmm. uses your school facility something like that maybe community um, maker space or job some I don't know center of affordable housing yeah. yeah then you'd start running into issues outside of your public financing issues then you'd run into state law issues the whole good things for mm -hmm. good people what you then start running into is depending on how you structured it if you structured it, you know, the, the, that legislation allows the district to donate, sell, lease property to other entities. So if you essentially took one of those buildings and you donated it to, a, say, a nonprofit entity to run and use as a community theater, you'd probably then run into a state law constitutional issue about whether or not you could spend public monies to improve a building that is going to be either owned or leased or operated by another entity. What you would probably have to start looking at is whether or not, you know, if you wanted to get creative, you might start looking at um, joint ventures or partnerships mm, or things like it? that. Yeah, where you not only maintain school district ownership, but you maintain some school district use. So if you were looking at after hours <coughs> use by, say, community groups, but school district use during the day, you, you'd have to get creative in how you structured it. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, if you're going to give it to, you know, for, for money or no, but if you're going to have somebody else who is using it, then you've got that whole state law, you've got just a purely state law issue of can you use public funds to benefit a private entity. So you have to keep it tied. You know, 
under that under that legislation, it doesn't have to be educational use. I mean, you could give it to somebody to use as a health care facility, mm -hmm. but once you take away the district's use and operation and the educational purpose of it, Financial. then you're looking at a whole other issue whether or not you issue tax-exempt bonds to pay for it. You, mm -hmm. You're then looking at whether or not school district money can benefit a private entity. And, and that in some ways we've talked about good things for good people as a way to get around the charter school mm -hmm. law it sounds like the constitutional issue that, that you just raised is se separate from that even if we were to surplus the property no charter school was interested we still have that constitutional question mm -hmm. okay um other uh other questions um doc we will just to name we will we will note that question and and you know at least give some some thought about like is there a broader community use issue that we want to explore yeah i mean it yeah it's, yeah it maybe sounds it's with great. these dollars maybe it's not with these dollars but the but the question remains mm -hmm. is there some broader community use that we think about um you know maintaining as a district property programming from you know from us from them whatever as this turner has described but we'll we'll log that question for that sounds great yeah to, uh, you know to bring a, a a building that's maybe out of service back online um again recognizing all the the legal hurdles I and mean, that's why we got y'all um is to help us figure out stuff like that um the uh, other, let, me, let me flag one more thing I, 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 I think I'm right about this, but I would love for clarity about that because uh, sometimes I know enough just to be dangerous. Um, <laughs> I, I think some of that for some of that has to be forethought because a lot of the taxable, non-taxable, that's at issuance, right? Like that ha that that piece has to be sort of solved. That piece of the puzzle has to be solved before you issue the bonds. Yes. There's not a conversion from one to the other, right? Exactly. So um, what we have in this resolution that obviously we're giving information on that potentially can be considered at the October 3rd, we do have the ability to issue one or more taxable or tax-exempt mm -hmm. series. But before you actually go into the market to sell, you would have to have that in place, right. an idea. Um, because otherwise, if you issued tax exempt debt and then it turned into taxable, we'd be running into a lot of other issues. And this is something you mentioned, but just uh, it was rattling around in the back of my head. Um, the percentage permissible on bad use? It is a percentage question, right? It, it is, yes. And we, we would have to analyze over, you know, whatever the project gotcha. is, how much we'd have to get an architect or what have you to, you know, kind of carve out a piece of the building or wh whatever the circumstances would be we'd have to analyze it and get with our right. you know tax committee and things like that to see but there is a percentage of bad use right. um, that, that can be done in a tax exempt project but it's very small mm -hmm. that's what that's what i was thinking it's that's really what i was looking for okay. it's a it's like not 15 percent no like it's small. more like five <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. okay yeah. so i just wanted to kind of flag that as you were talking about the thinking through what our options are some of that we may we may need to get a little more granular mm -hmm. or not you might want to keep it large and set some of that stuff to the side but but that's um just something to put in the hopper i think gotcha um, another oh, oh and i was going to say the resolution um obviously has a not to exceed 57 million um we're talking about potentially doing 30 million but uh, once you get past your no protest stage, you have the ability to issue not to exceed the 57. So if you issued 30 and you decided to come back and do a second series once you've kind of worked through some of those other issues and agreed to um, the projects, you have the difference um, to do a second series as well. That's good to know as well. And, and, and specifically in reference to the 57 versus the 30, um, is, is this a, a, an accurate characterization? The 57 is our cap. That's it. The yes. 30 million basically keeps the impact on the taxpayers relatively constant around what it it's, is right now. It's really project based. Yes, it um, so to keep your bonds tax exempt, you have to be able to expend the funds within three years. Mm -hmm. So what they're looking at is 
you know, obviously the 57 million is what you could do with your full three mills, um, but if your projects only uh, for the next three years allow you to do 30 million, then that's the amount that you have to do because you want to make sure you spend your funds yeah. within the three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if any, at any point over the 15 year period, we, we wanted to tap, if we do 30 and want to tap the additional 27, we could come back and tap that? Once it's, yes, once the no protest period has passed, yes. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, one other question I asked, because I wanted, I wanted to get this in front of the board members, was around our amortization schedule of, of debt. It's behind a password protected <laughs> piece. Um, is there any way to talk us through? The, the big thing I wanted to make sure is I know when we were structuring the 2018 bond, you know, mm -hmm. there, there were payments that would change over time. Not often, but sometimes things go up when something rolls off. Again, largely to keep the payments for the district um, the similar. And I just wanted to make sure there's nothing, if you take all, if you look at all of our debt, and you take it all the way to maturity, that for future boards, there's no spikes that, that, we're, that we're setting up a, a future board to have to navigate. Um, what's that? No. Oh, okay. oh you're, you're exactly correct. And I'm going to go backwards. As I said, you, I wanted you to think of your debt in two separate silos, general obligation mm -hmm. bonds, again, that were voted on by the people and then the limited tax, or otherwise known as three mil notes. If we're just looking, well, in both cases, but we're here we're talking about the limited tax, the three mil notes. If we're just looking at the limited tax notes, that annual payment we will keep, um, we will keep level from there because we know that we have those three mils that are gonna be used to pay for it. So it's gonna wrap around, but if you look at it from a bird's eye view, we're gonna keep those payments the same. That's gonna be underneath what you collect in those three mils. When we did the 65 million, mm -hmm. I think it was in 2018 or 2019, we did the exact same thing, but we did it from the GO perspective. So we looked at all those bonds collectively, and we kept that payment rel relatively the same overall. So the tax levy to the taxpayers is going to look similar. It's going to look level all the way down. But you don't want to look at those together because they have two different funding sources, two different securities, two different payment mm -hmm. options. So, so my question is, um, I, I feel good about the levy on the taxpayers. My question is more about the debt service from the district perspective, it, 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 you know, in terms of this. So in five years, like, there's not a, a payment that goes from, like, you know, a million dollars to three million dollars. Not, not from a bird's eye view of just the limited tax by themselves. It may have where, and so, for example, this 2012s are paying off in October this year. Right. So they'll, they'll pop off. So there's a little gap that we'll make sure that we, if we decide to do 30 million, 57 million, we fill in that gap. And then, just because I have it in front of me, the 2017s pay off in 2028. So when we issue this supposed 30 million, when you get to 2029, it'll go up a little bit. But when you look at the district's payments overall on just those limited tax bonds, it'll be level. We'll fill in that gap. So when the district goes out to set their budget, and I don't, ha I apologize about this, I don't have the overall debt schedule because I knew I sent it earlier or whatever, and I apologize it behind the password protected. But if your total annual debt service is, let's just say, a dollar, it will always be a dollar all the way down. If one falls out, we increase the principal payment on another one such that its overall debt service is just going to be a dollar every single year. So you're not putting an additional burden on future boards because you know that you're collecting a dollar, a dollar twenty-five from your three mills. We're going to keep that annual debt service on those three mill notes at a dollar all the way down. Okay. So ho hopefully, I, I was able to explain that. You yeah, have. I, I do. I before we vote, I want to make sure. Mrs. Purnell, Dr. Green, at the board, that we see that whole schedule. Um, and and, 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 and I, well, let me do this. Let me send it back tomorrow, what we're thinking, and we'll use the 30 million as the, as the number. We'll put that in there and wrap it around so we can show you what it looks like on just the three mil notes. Side. Well, I don't know. I want to see the whole debt service be, because I'm, I'm, my biggest concern is, a, is about, is, 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 is on our budget. Correct. And so, 
I, I hear you 100% in terms of we got the limited tax notes, the GO bonds, but when we approve the budget, like what I don't want, and it's probably not this way, but I feel like there's something in the back of my mind when we were setting up the amortization schedule for the GO bond mm -hmm. that there were some larger payments that were moved into the future mm -hmm. that moved in as other debt rolled off mm -hmm. to keep district payments level overall the total debt service Correct. and so by i just want to make sure if when we we bring this because i i want to do this because i want all the things that we talked about but what i don't want to do if there is a an instance where a payment was set to increase by a million dollars or two millions as a share of our overall debt service to contemplating other debt rolling off Gotcha. That, that, that we're not going to get to a point in place where a future board is going to, the COO comes up and says, we got a million dollars, we got to increase our debt service by a million dollars. And, and again, it's probably not that way, but there were just, there were fluctuations that I seem to remember. That's why I want to see the whole gotcha. thing. I, and I will make sure I send that over tomorrow. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to send it to you. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Any other? I don't think there's any other questions. Are we, are we good? No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I will say, um, uh, Mr. Thompson with um, government, and, government Advisors, is that the name of the Consultant. government consultants in, in the Butler Snow team? Um, you know, they worked on the 2018 GO bond. Um, and one thing I appreciate is obviously because of COVID and other. Um, you know, just everything that was going on in the world, you know, we had a three-year window to get those dollars out. We did not get there. Um, appreciate all the work that you all did to help us figure out a path forward to be able to expend all those dollars beyond the, the three years. And so um, just I want to lift that up in terms of just ways this team has helped us out in the past. So, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Green. All right, board members. Um, we're going to move on to our information action items. Um, and thank you all for um, that information and, and um, for uh, more to come. All right, the, we have the request to approve RFP 2023-16 for after school summer academic enrichment programs, agreements, and activities for the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Samicia Stokes, our executive director of the Office of Innovative Strategy, will present this information. Dr. Stokes. Yes, good evening. Good evening. President Sivak, board members, Superintendent Dr. Green, and our JPS community. The administration presents for approval the after school summer academic enrichment program agreements and activities for the Jackson Public School District. JPS scholars will have equitable access to high quality free after school programs with on-site programming at 37 school sites and off-site programming at two sites. Our JPS Transportation Department and Child Nutrition Department will provide transportation as well as an after-school meal at no cost to parents. Parents do have the option of picking up their child from the after-school site. Programming is Monday through Thursday from 2.30 to 5.30 for elementary students, 3.30 to 6 o'clock for middle school scholars, and 4.05 to 6.35 for high school scholars. After school providers developed content and programs that align with and support our school's instructional programs and accelerate learning by providing literacy and math reinforcement and other pandemic specific social supports focused on youth centric strategies that build on the needs, strengths and challenges of our youth. Enrichment offerings and activities along with high quality programming for our JPS scholars range from foreign language, health and fitness, visual and performing arts and cultural explorations to academic enrichment and high dosage tutoring in reading and math, all to ensure that our students have access to high quality levels of learning and engagement in our after school ecosystem. Thank you in advance for your support. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Stokes. Board members, any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. I think what we'll do, board, unless there's any objection, we'll go ahead and we'll just run through all of the information action and vote on them as a, as a, all together. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, next, we have uh, Attorney Harris, uh, our general counsel, who will um, present the request to approve our workers' compensation insurance policy for Jackson Public Schools. Attorney Harris. Good evening, Board Good evening. President and Dr. Seabag, Board Members, Dr. Green. The Office of the General Counsel's Department of Risk Management is recommending that the Jackson Public School Board of Trustees permit the Evans Agency to purchase workers' compensation insurance coverage through Bitco Insurance Company in order to continue to provide workers' compensation insurance policy for the district. Um, our policy has decreased. The premium has decreased from the previous years. Um, the 2022-2023 uh, policy was one million nine hundred ninety six thousand three hundred dollars and then the policy for this upcoming year for the 23-24 year is one million eight hundred sixty nine thousand six hundred and seventeen dollars and the decrease is in part due to our response our responsiveness and workers compensation reporting we're decreasing our lag time and reporting which is enabling us to um, get employees treated uh, more quickly and back to work Thank you, Attorney Harris. Board members, are there any questions, comments? Just a quick comment. I just want to um, lift up all the work that's been done to pull these, this request together. Um, uh, I can remember a time when we would be getting these requests 48, 24 hours before the policy was about to expire. So um, thank you for all the work. And also thank you for the this is district-wide work that has gone into just having the premiums decrease. Um, we saw what happened to our property insurance premiums. Um, and so I know I had a number of questions about the team that was working to source insurance quotes. So it's good to see quotes come in that are decreasing, but also the work that's, that's district wide that, that went into that. So just wanted to lift up that your work, your leadership, uh, Attorney Harris and everyone else who, who made this happen. And thank you. Um, and this is something that our um, consultants will tell you that we can actually, we have a better hand in control and we can't control the markets with property insurances. But workers' compensation is something that we can um, do things to be proactive and to try to get the cost down. Great. Thank you. Next, we have the request to approve the Legacy Scholars Grant Agreement with the Equal Justice Initiative for Provine High School. Attorney Harris. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending that the Jackson Public School District's Board of Trustees approve the grant agreement between Equal Justice Initiative on behalf of Provine High School. Um, Provine is re will be receiving a grant in the amount of $10,500 to cover the cost for 90 students and nine chaperones to visit the Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And they'll be attending, um, and this is in Montgomery, Alabama, and they'll be attending on December the 20th, 2023. And also, we do have a group. That group's trip got um, postponed, so they'll be attending tomorrow, the group from the Career Development Center. And so they will be at the first board meeting in October to report on their experiences there. So we're excited to have them, and they're excited to come and talk to you all as well. Great. Thank you. Any questions, comments, board members? All right. Thank you, Attorney Harris. Thank you. Next, we have the request to approve the extension of the agreement between the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality and the Jackson Public School District. Uh, this is for the purchase of our electric buses, I believe. Um, and Ms. Harris Martin, our Executive Director of Transportation, will present this information. Good afternoon, President Sivak, to the board members and to Dr. Green. On this evening, the administration is recommending the approval to extend the original agreement between the Mississippi Department of Environment Quality and Jackson Public Schools. This agreement granted funds to us to allow us to purchase one bus. The grant was, a, was called the DARA Grant, which is a diesel emission uh, reduction act grant. And so we were awarded to purchase one bus in replace of a 2001 Freightliner bus. We are asking that the um, agreement be modified simply because the expiration date for this performance grant is on September 30th of this month. Um, the bus will not be delivered until after that time. So it, it is needed for us to get an extension on this agreement. 
the Department of Environment Quality has agreed to offer us a no-cost time extension that will go through September 30th of next year. So we are asking that this be approved. Great. Thank you. Yes. Board members, any questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Sayers Martin. Um, next, we have the request to approve the canceling and releasing of the 16 section lease agreement between Jackson Public School District and Garrett Tires and Trucking Services. Mr. Jackson, our Executive Director of Finance and Operations, will present this information. Good evening, Dr. Seabag, board members, Dr. Green, JPS team. The administration recommends approval of canceling and releasing the 16 section lease agreement between the Jackson Public School District. Garrett Tires and Trucking Service, LLC. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Board members, are there any questions, comments? Thank you. Next, uh, we have the request to approve the purchase of buses. Um, and Mrs. Purnell, um, who was with us earlier, uh, our Executive Director of Business Services will uh, present this information. Good evening again with the protocol already been established. <laughs> um, the uh, administration is recommending that the board approve the purchase of, let's see how many buses we have here, of three buses from the, um, the pre-K pre collaborative grant that we uh, have secured through the support of Dr. Cormack and uh, his team uh, with, those, with, that, um, with that endeavor. So, and they, these are state funds. I would like to mention that as well. These are not federal dollars. I know a question came up about the um, allowability of these funds. These are state funds that uh, are granted through the uh, Mississippi Department of Education. Uh, and these, uh, this transportation, these buses were also um, a part of the budget that was submitted um, three, years, three years ago? Three years ago, I believe, uh, initially. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Purnell. And I believe the next um, oh, item is for the purchase of buses as well, but also uh, using a different funding source. Correct. The administration recommends that the, the board approves the purchase of four buses through the ESSER funds, that they have also um, allocated funds for that purpose as well. And it's four buses they, they are um, requesting that you all approve for them to purchase. Thank you, Mrs. Purnell. Board yeah. members, any questions, comments? A um, couple questions, just I think, helpful for the public to hear. Um, how, Ms. Pernod, how many buses do we currently have in our fleet? Um, we have 209. 209. And um, do you have a sense of you know, what percentage are 15 years or older? Uh, I do have that information that I think or I Or just could. numbers are fine as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do have that documentation. Give me one second. I do have that. That um, here we go. Out of the 209 buses that we do have, um, you say how many was how many are old? 15 years or older. 15 or older. We have 57. We have 57, and it looks like we have 57 that are 15 to 20 years old, and maybe even <laughs> an additional. We have additional 18 that's over 20 over years. Over 20 old. years. Correct. So. A little over a third of our buses are 15 years or older, and so it's, I mean, it's, it's time. So it's it great is. to see all the work um, that's going into it. I know we approved the purchase of 25 electric buses, um, so that's exciting. Uh, so again, just in keeping up with the conversation earlier around facilities, just <coughs> upgrading how we show up, look, feel for our scholars. So. And just a note on that, these um, three plus, what is it, three plus five? Three plus four. Three and four. Three plus so the four. seven yeah. that we're um, asking for a purchase approval to purchase tonight would be an addition to the two oh nine. But the twenty is it or twenty five? Twenty five. Twenty five electric buses. The requirement, as I understand it, is to swap those out replace. to remove replace the um, older buses, the ones that are 
you know, um, less energy efficient. So um, excited to have those on the fleet and, and to be a part. I think it'll be like 15 percent, somewhere on the order mm -hmm. of about 15 percent of our buses would be electric, electric buses. Mm -hmm. um, but again, they would swap out some of those older ones. And so there's still a need to, to continue to, and you'll likely see further requests over time um, to purchase and, and upgrade our fleet, um, both from energy efficiency, but also just uh, reliability um, and air conditioning. Yes, and air conditioning. <laughs> all those sorts of things. But you actually just touched on a point that was a question that, that I had. The seven that we're talking about tonight, those are additive. Yes. 216 now, not yes. 200, not right, if, assuming you get them. Um, Okay, that was it. Yep. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay, here we are. We are at the request to approve the resolution authorizing the employment of professionals in connection with the issuance of the limited tax note or series of taxable or tax exempt notes not to exceed $57 million. Mrs. Purnell. Okay. The administration recommends the approval of Butler Snow of Regional Mississippi, as noted as um, Council Dorian Turner, uh, as District Council Government Consultants for Madison as Municipal uh, Advisor and Cruz and Associates uh, from Little Rock, Arkansas as Underwriter or Placement Agent and authorizes the approved professionals professionals to prepare and distribute such resolutions and documents necessary to facilitate the sale and issuance of such note and or notes not to exceed $57 million. Thank you, Mrs. Purnell. Board members, any questions? Um, Mrs. Purnell, could you run through the fee schedule for the um, consultant? Okay. <laughs> Naomi is coming. He does okay. have that for me. Again, Namdi Thompson with Government Consultants. Uh, what I sent over to the district a little bit earlier was based, the fees based off of the type of sale. So um, I'm sorry, I think every time I get up here, I always want to do like a bonds 101. So if you give me just a Bring second, it. And then I'll answer, Bring it. <laughs> I'll answer your question. So when we go out and sell debt, notes, or bond issues, there's a couple of different ways we can sell and get the bonds out to the public or out to qualified ins institutional investors. One of the ways that we're considering is selling this through a private placement. When we sell it by a private placement sale, um, we will limit the amount of people or amount of institutions that we go out and sell the bonds to. That has some advantages and disadvantages. And I think I might have sent this over there to you, but I don't want to belabor the point. We're looking at those advantages and disadvantages of selling it that way. Another way we can sell it is through a negotiated sale. We'll go out and go sell it to retail investors. We can theoretically sell it to any of the people sitting in this audience today as well as high net worth individuals. There are some advantages and disadvantages to that as well. Depending on the type of sale parameter, the costs are going to be a little bit different because you have to do certain things in order to get them out to public. So in answering your question, Dr. Seaback, if we were looking at a private placement sale, we will look somewhere around 2% of the cost of issuance. So if it is going to be 30 million total cost of issuance for all the various professionals, we would be somewhere around $600,000. That's a not to exceed amount. But that, what well, we want to do an estimated cost right now because one, that was one of the questions that was posed. But then also, we have not been engaged, so it's hard for us to go out and talk to prospective purchasers. If we go out and go um, do it as a negotiated sale, it would be underneath 3% cost of uh, the bond issue. So again, if it's a $30 million transaction, total cost of issuance again for all the professionals would be somewhere around 900000 So one would have a higher upfront cost, but, and I, I said I didn't want to go in and go into the advantages and disadvantages. However, though, the one with the higher upfront cost possibly can get us a lower interest rate. And over the life of the transaction of 15 years, that difference in cost is more than covered, whatever. But we want to make sure, and one of my uh, functions as a fiduciary to the district is try to figure out what's the best possible sales method for the district and what the, the, the projects you're trying to accomplish. So depending on each, it could either be 2% of the cost of issuance, excuse me, 2% of the par amount, or 3%. Thank and, you, Mr. And again, Thompson. those are just not to exceed amounts, though. And I think one important point, um, just looking at the two, you know, the estimated cost for a private placement relative to a public offering is 
the, the fees of bond council, of, of, of district council, of municipal finance advisor, um, it's the same for either. It looks like the, the, the difference is largely in insurance and the underwriting fee. Bingo, you're absolutely correct. So if we, on the one that's higher, the possibility is we can go sell out, sell it to retail investors. When we do that, we want to go get insurance so we can give some comfort to some of those purchasers because it's not going to be the big, or well, for the most part, it's not going to be the big hedge funds. It's not going to be Bill Gates. We're going to sell it to smaller investors who are going to buy it in $10,000, dollars $20,000 blocks. They like to have insurance on there so that if there was any problems five years down the line, they're covered. And so you pay that upfront fee for the insurance, and then we sell it based upon that insurance, and the rate can come down some. Also, on the underwriter standpoint, now since they're selling it to, and the whole world is their oyster at this point, we have to, they have to have a more of an incentive to go out and find those smaller investors. Whereas if we do a private placement, they're just talking to the big hedge funds. And again, we'll go back and forth. We'll figure out which one's going to be the best for the district, and then we'll make that, our findings to the district and see if they agree that this is the way we should do it. But neither one has been decided yet. Great. Thank you. Any other additional questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Thank Thompson. You. Thank you, Mrs. Purnell. Um, Mrs. Purnell, are you also doing the monthly financial report? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the uh, administration recommends the, that the board approve the monthly financial report for the month ending August 31st, 2023. Um, the, there are a few highlights from the uh, report. You know, we always have the statement of fund balance, the um, budget status report, the bank reconciliation, and the cash flow. So from the statement of fund balance, um, the note, these numbers are preliminary, but they're pretty close to being the close, the real, real numbers. I'm real close. I think today, Dr. Green, I can say that the um, Federal Exchange Transaction System Report has been approved. So we are good with that. So we are at the point of closing June 30th. So that's a good note on that. So these numbers are very, very close to exactly what I think the final will actually be. But um, for uh, 2024 beginning fund balance, it's roughly $22 million. I think that's where we're going to end, and we will bring that back on October 3rd <laughs> board meeting to let you know exactly what the amended budgets are and where we ended. But I think this is going to be probably our very good close numbers that you'll see that same number going forward uh, compared to $21 million last year. So a little increase, so we, we, that's good on that note for that. Um, for the fund balance as of August 31st, it, our fund balance right now is at, at, at that time was $16.2 million, roughly $200,000 lower than what it was uh, last year around this time. Uh, expenditures did exceed uh, revenues approximately about $6.5 million. Our uh, 16 section revenue is pretty much on target. We have about 17.42% of the, of the budget at this time. So that's where our uh, fund balance stand currently. On our special revenues, uh, child nutrition continues to have a significant fund balance, which is supporting the school's cafeteria, which is great. Our special revenue, as we all know, that we have the drawdowns, and when the drawdowns come, then we will, and there's always a lag, you know, we have one month, then the next month, so when we catch up, you still have other expenditures. As we all know, we have to expend the funds before you can actually request those. So we had about $7.1 million, down a little bit than what it was, I think, last month, on where our expenditures are. We were able to draw at least, uh, I think, about $14 million last month, so we did pretty good on uh, getting those funds in, so it wasn't really bad on those, so we did pretty good there. On the budget status, here we are pretty much right now, we like 8.1% of our revenue of being collected uh, of budget at this point in time, and we are, expenditures, we've spent about 11.3% of the budget at this current time, and that's pretty much moderate in what we had previously. I think last year around this time, our um, revenue was r roughly about 11%, and our expenditures were roughly about 13% at that particular time uh, at the same um, venture. And we have... Okay. Uh, also, all the district bank accounts are with approved um, 
bank approved um, depositories along with the board as well and the bank statements are reconciled through on uh, July 31st of 2023 at currently which we are doing them appropriately the cash flow the end cash flow balance for this month is roughly about 2.4 uh, compared to last year, we were about 1.5, and I think that's pretty much contributing to some of the um, funds that we were able to draw more this month, and then therefore I didn't have to, we didn't have to loan as much to some of the um, federal aid uh, department's grants that we had to do previously, so I think that helped us in that uh, endeavor. Other management key uh, performance indicators, I think that Mr. Burke wanted me to share with you all as of uh, August the 31st, that our overall revenues collected is um, about $565,000. It's 83% greater than uh, last year. The overall expenditures, mm, 547000 It's less than uh, last year. Our avalorum is a little less, which is normal for us around this time at this point in the um, in the game and our um, personnel and um, French benefits lines is a little greater than last year. Of course, with all the different raises and different things that the district did put in place for this year, so they would be greater. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mrs. Purnell. Board members, any questions on that very thorough report? Thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, we've run through items A through I. Um, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Mrs. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, everyone, for all your work tonight. To our fine council, our municipal advisor, our note council, Attorney Turner. Um, we look forward to working with you. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Um, next, we will move on to our consent agenda item for finance. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item finance? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have our consent agenda items personnel. Um, board members, uh, please note Ms. Williams forward over the additional personnel items. Did you skip general? Yes, I skipped general. Thank you. Um, we have our consent agenda items general. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board. We had an opportunity to ask questions. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda general? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Attorney Turner. I two. I two. Just I two and I four. I two. Just I two. Okay. Um, board members, um, we have our consent agenda item personnel. I did want to note we have the additional um, positions that Mrs. Williams sent over. Um, we will be speaking about I-2, and are we pulling I-2, or we're pulling I-2 um, from the consent agenda personnel. We're going to discuss item I-4. We're pulling I-4 for discussion in executive session. Is that it, or I-3? I assume you would consider it, because until you actually vote. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move I-4 for consideration in executive, for consideration session. In executive session and... Pulling I two, just I two. We're not doing I three. Right. Okay. So we are pulling I two for um, cons for approval. We are moving I four for consideration in executive session. Is there a motion to approve? M motion to approve the remaining items other than I two and I four. Thank you. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Wait, was. Aye. was okay. Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. The motion carries. All right, board members, we do have a couple of items for consideration in executive session. Is there a motion to close the meeting to consider executive session? I still move. 
Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Yay. All right. Um. Save the Music Foundation is so happy to be partnering with Jackson Public Schools, Jackson State University, and the Mississippi Orc Chapter to be doing a workshop led by Dr. Patrick Ware, a renowned workshop clinician in Orc pedagogy, on the um, methods and classroom ideas for the elementary music room. Orc Schulwerk is an approach to teaching music that focuses on creativity and it focuses on having students be able to be the best musicians they can using what they do naturally, which is play. Three bar on the